Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Welcome to those of you in the room, and for those of you online, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm Sarah Barnes. Um, I lead the work at the Maternal Health Initiative, along with my colleagues, Dikshita Ramanarayanan and Ria Karta, here at the Wilson Center. Um, for those of you who are new to the Wilson Center, we are a presidential memorial established as part of the Smithsonian Institute by an act of Congress in 1938. We are a nonpartisan and non-advocacy think tank, and our mission is to provide insights on global affairs to policymakers, practitioners, academics, and beyond through deep research, impartial analyses, and independent scholarship. And the Maternal Health Initiative is one of the thematic programs here at the Wilson Center. And we work across all global regions, looking at issues of global health equity, gender equality, security, and US foreign policy. We're thrilled to be here today, um, back in person, and to be working in partnership with USAID's Momentum Routine Immunization, Transformation, and Equity Project to bring you this important discussion on advancing local solutions and innovations for lasting impact, applying strategies for COVID-19 vaccination to routine immunization. A special thank you to USA's Momentum Right and JSI for making this event possible and for bringing this important discussion to the Wilson Center stage. Today we have a packed agenda across two hours. Um, we've got experts from Ethiopia, the DRC, India, Nigeria, Kenya, Mozambique, and the United States. Thank you so much, everyone who's traveled far to be with us here today. And thank you to those of you in the room and those of you online for sharing your time with us today. For those in our audience, both virtually and here in person, there will be a time for panel questions during the Q&A session. Um, and so please think of your questions now, and we do ask that you keep those to questions and not comments due to the short time we have for this event today. Um, some quick other logistics. There's a QR code with full bios and agenda right outside the doors of the auditorium. It is also at the bottom of the screen for those of you who are watching online. Um, the QR code has the full bio, so we will just give short introductions of all of our speakers today. It also has the agenda um, for you to follow along. During the audience Q&A, we'll take two to three questions, um, and then we'll let the uh, panel choose, pick and choose which ones they would like to respond to. For the people online, you can put um, your questions into the chat function underneath the video that is streaming live now. Um, and the video of this recording will be shared within the next 24 hours, and we will also be publishing an event summary on the dot .mom column of the new Security Beat blog before the end of the year. So now to the main event. I would like to first introduce our moderator for today, Grace Chi. Grace is sitting down here at the moment, but she will be joining us on stage in a moment. Grace is the Project Director of Momentum Routine Immunization Transformation and Equity Project at JSI. Grace has more than 25 years of experience in health financing, immunization financing, health system strengthening, and maternal and child health programs. A huge thank you uh, both to Grace and Katie Cook for all the work that you've done and everyone at JSI and USAID for all of the back and forth and the background work that it takes to put together a panel like this. Um, and before turning things to Grace, it is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for today, Dr. Falaki Oleinka, who unfortunately could not be here in person, so we have some recorded remarks. D Dr. Olenki is the immunization technical lead at the Global Health Bureau at USAID in Washington, DC, and she's a globally recognized leader with expertise in strengthening routine immunization systems, polio eradication, um, maternal and child health, malaria, HIV and AIDS, sexual and reproductive health, and adolescent reproductive health. Dr. Olenka will kick things off, and then Grace Chi will join us on the stage and guide us through the duration of the program. Thank you all very much again for being here. A warm welcome, and you can start the rec recorded remarks. Let me start by extending a warm welcome to all of you. I also want to acknowledge the important role you and many others have played at multiple levels in responding to this unprecedented pandemic. Your efforts have helped to save lives around the globe. Vaccination against COVID-19 has been a critical tool in responding to the pandemic, preventing severe disease and deaths. 
When vaccines became widely available in early 2021, there were many unknowns who were using new vaccines, including the use of new technologies. And some required special coaching that was not widely available. There were multiple vaccines that needed to be stored and also administered in different ways. Global vaccine supply and equity was limited and there was limited experience in reaching high-risk populations at scale with vaccination services. This confluence of multiple new vaccines, new variants of concern, emerging evidence and rapid learning along with changing health recommendations made messaging and communications to the general public more challenging than usual. Vaccination demand and confidence fell in many places and there was a rise in rumors and misconceptions across the globe. Successful vaccination not only entailed managing logistics of vaccine delivery, but also building widespread trust in vaccination, including among the health personnel prioritized for vaccination and tasked with providing the service. The Momentum Routine Immunization Transformation and Equity Project, as USID's global technical leadership project for immunization was one of the mechanisms for providing technical assistance to support COVID-19 vaccination. Through this project and many other projects focusing on COVID-19 vaccinations, USID has made significant investments supporting more than 100 countries in the global vaccination effort. Today, you will hear about the project's work supporting national and subnational governments in their extraordinary efforts to vaccinate large swaths of the population in record time. USID funding enabled investments and innovations in community networks that provided accurate information about vaccines and helped to plan services to maximize accessibility, improving data systems to monitor the progress of vaccination and decision-making, and increased use of digital tools, strengthening supply chains to get vaccines to all corners of all countries, training health workers to handle and administer the vaccines, as well as to respond to client questions about the vaccine, and strategic and technical support to governments to bring new and old partners together in order to achieve the enormous goal Momentum was one of few mechanisms supported by USID, which included a scope for COVID-19 vaccinations, in addition to the goal of finding new solutions to obstacles constraining high and equitable immunization coverage. While health officials focused their attention on achieving COVID-19 vaccination goals around the world, immunization, routine immunization, did not fare as well during this period as part of the negative fallout of the pandemic. Between 2019 and 2021, approximately 67 million children missed out on essential life-saving vaccines, the largest sustained backsliding of childhood vaccination. However, in 2022, there were promising signs of recovery to near pre-pandemic levels though this recovery is uneven, with low-income countries not yet seeing immunization recovery. The disruptions caused by the pandemic in 2020 and 2021 have subsided slightly, though in the recent WHO Pulse survey that was issued in May 2023, over 84% of countries still reported disruptions to one or more essential services. Today's event is organized not only to take stock of achievements in COVID-19 vaccination, but also to reflect on what we have learned and what innovations can be applied to improve routine immunization and get back on track to reach global immunization goals. USID and their partners will continue to work with host governments to bring partners and stakeholders together to review progress, make adjustments as necessary, and hold each other accountable in order to reach our common goals. Thank you for being a part of this and look forward to the event today. 
Hello, everyone. Um, as Sarah mentioned, my name is Grace Chi. I'm the project director for Momentum Routine Immunization Transformation and Equity Project. Although Falake wasn't able to join us today because she's traveling, we're really grateful she took time to record that message that sets the stage for our discussion. I want to welcome you, everyone in the room, as well as those joining us online, and thank you for your interest in immunization and in our work. I also want to thank the Wilson Center and especially Sarah Barnes for their collaboration in today's program. I'd like to take a few minutes to give an overview of our project, talk a bit about the rationale for our event today and the program that we have lined up for you. As Falaki said, Momentum Routine Immunization is USAID's global technical leadership project for immunization. We were designed to improve the equity of routine immunization. But for about two years of our project, we were focused almost entirely on COVID-19 vaccination. We supported 18 countries and worked with 109 partners to support COVID vaccination. We trained 145,000 health workers and directly supported administration of 21 million shots in arms. As we brought our attention back to routine immunization this year, we realized that so much of what's needed for immunization is exactly what we did for COVID-19 vaccination. The strong coordination mechanisms that brought partners together to review progress and urgently take action and make adjustments as needed. The openness to bringing in new partners because the scale of the effort was so large and the engagement with communities where we listened to what they needed in terms of where and when to provide services. This is what's needed now for routine immunization, not only to recover or catch up, but also to make progress, real progress, from where we were for many years. We wanted to organize this program to take stock of what we've done and share information about new or redesigned approaches to help us address obstacles to equitable coverage of routine immunization and other health services. We designed the program so we could dig deep into four countries, and we're really fortunate to have an excellent panel of implementers from India, Kenya, Mozambique, and Nigeria. We chose these countries as they're among our largest programs, and we're working to support both COVID-19 vaccination as well as routine immunization. We plan the bulk of our program to focus on hearing about their experiences from COVID-19 vaccination, and their takeaways for strengthening routine immunization. And during that discussion, we will take time for audience questions. Before we go into that, we also organize four lightning talks that will give you a glimpse into our targeted work in areas that are critical to successful vaccination, but sometimes are a bit less visible. You'll hear these speakers describe how we contributed to global guidance, supported adaptations to implementation based on real-time data, and worked hand in hand with health workers and health managers to implement change. Right after the lightning talks, we have a very special video that we're excited to show you. So please let me introduce our lightning speakers who are with me here on the stage. Our first speaker is Rebecca Fields, the technical director on the project, and she'll tell us about work at global level to support COVID vaccination. The second lightning speaker will be Anna Kostake, She's a technical officer with MRIGHT, and she'll talk about work in Niger to improve code chain maintenance. Then we have Tredros Almayehu, who will describe his work to integrate COVID vaccination into the measles campaign in Addis Ababa. Unfortunately, he's not able to join us today, and his talk has been pre-recorded. Lastly, we'll have Constant Kingongo, our monitoring and evaluation lead from DRC, talking about work to transform the data system for COVID coverage data so that it can be more manageable within the resource constraints in DRC. And we want to thank Jessica Shearer, the male lead on the project, who will be translating for Constant so that he can share his experience here today. We hope these snippets will really bring to life how we marry our technical expertise with the project ethos to use data to continuously assess our work, to identify what's working well and not as well, and to work together with local leaders and communities to develop solutions and make improvements. So let me invite Rebecca Fields to start us off, and I will not be making additional introductions between the lightning speakers. 
Thank you very much, Grace, and uh, a warm welcome to everybody for joining us today. I'm just going to take a few moments to describe some of our global efforts to support the rollout of COVID-19 vaccination. Um, and you'll note that many of these activities, actually all of them were carried out in close coordination and collaboration with other global partners and implementing partners of USAID. So just to set the stage, let's think back to where we were three years ago. There were no COVID-19 vaccines. Um, WHO's strategic advisory group of experts had identified who the high priority groups were for COVID vaccination based both on the disease epidemiology, but also recognizing that vaccine supplies were going to be limited, at least at first. Um, WHO, COVAX, and other partners were already working as quickly as possible to try to prepare countries to be able to introduce the vaccines just as soon as they became available. And that meant doing a lot of advanced planning. One aspect of that planning was to develop guidelines for what were called country-level national vac deployment and vaccination plans, NDVPs. Countries were required to develop those NDVPs in order to be able to qualify for actually obtaining COVID vaccine through uh, the COVAX mechanism. So in late 2020, even before the vaccines were available, we contributed to the development of those NDVP guidelines that were subsequently used by countries around the world. Uh, in early 2021, we then collaborated with WHO, AFRO, and UNICEF to manage a process to very, very rapidly um, uh, do a pre-review of those NDVPs from about eight countries in West and Central Africa in order to really assure the quality of them so that they would be accepted as quickly and expeditiously as possible um, so that there would be very few delays with actually getting the vaccines and uh, with countries starting to roll them out. But it's one thing to have a plan. It's another thing to have that plan costed out and to be able to implement it and to have it financed. So as a companion to these national deployment and vaccination plans, WHO encouraged countries to undertake a costing exercise, and they developed a costing tool for doing so. But it was very challenging to do so. Uh, they put this together very quickly, and also they based it on the experience with childhood vaccination. But now we were vaccinating different priority groups. We were vaccinating adults. We were vaccinating health workers. We were vaccinating people whose uh, size of population was not very well known. And um, also serve different service delivery strategies were needed to be able to reach those populations. So we contributed to um, optimizing, revising and optimizing that costing tool to make it more transparent, to make it easier to use, and most importantly, to make it so that it would really reflect the service delivery strategies that countries intended to use. That information on costing then was used at global level to identify where the funding gaps were and to articulate the steps for closing those gaps. Okay, so now we've got plans and we know how much those plans cost, but those were all at national level. But even having those good national plans isn't quite enough. Um, to get vaccines out to all who need them, more detailed planning is needed at subnational levels. So in immunization, we have a long tradition of what is called micro-planning. These are very detailed plans that are developed at facility level, health clinic level, and at um, district level to identify where and when to provide vaccination and to identify the exact quantities of resources needed to do so. Um, previously, micro-planning guidelines that were available globally had been based on childhood vaccination. We knew how to do that. What we didn't know how to do was adapt micro-planning to reach these new special populations and to meet the special vaccine handling requirements that we'll hear more from Annika Stake about in a moment, um, and to also deal with changing guidelines and requirements that were being developed in real time by WHO, COVAX, Gavi, UNICEF, and others. Uh, so in early 2021, WHO undertook a process for developing new micro-planning guidelines specifically for COVID vaccination. 
um, we had a role in uh, contributing to the development of those guidelines and reviewing them. And then WHO looked to us to do a field test of them under real world circumstances, which we did in Nigeria. Um, and the findings from that Nigeria pretest were then used to revise and update these draft guidelines, which since have been posted by WHO for global use. Now you'll notice that with all of those tools, we as a project were not developing new global guidance. That was by design, that was by intent. We really wanted to tap into these coordinated global efforts so as not to overwhelm countries with a variety of different tools. The last point I'll just touch on now relates to USAID's role as a critical provider of technical assistance to support COVID-19 vaccine rollout. Um, USAID used over 60 different mechanisms and implementing partners to support such vaccine rollout, to provide technical assistance. Uh, it was really an all hands on deck effort. So to, mo to promote real time sharing of experience and sharing of new innovations and the identification of new challenges and how implementing partners were um, in, uh, addressing them, USAID requested that our project, together with another project called Datafy, establish a forum to promote and facilitate such sharing. We served as the secretariat for what was called USAID's COVID-19 Vaccine Technical Assistance Implementing Partners Forum, the implement, it's quite a long name, Implementing Partners Forum for short. Um, and from mid-2021 through the middle of 2023, we organized meetings um, initially on a monthly basis and then on a quarterly basis each one on a different theme, and each one highlighting the contributions and the expertise of the different implementing partners that USAID had funded to support COVID vaccine rollout. Um, and we addressed a whole variety of critical topics, uh, uh, demand creation, uh, supply chain and cold chain management, uh, data management, big challenges with that, community engagement, reaching the high priority groups for COVID vaccination, and different methods of capacity building. Now, it was really critical to create a safe environment within that forum so that people felt that they could show both what was going well, but also wasn't what wasn't going all that well, so that we all had the opportunity to learn from that. This really required some frank discussion about um, what the experiences were. And one of the things that the forum really laid bare was that even though such areas as demand creation and cold chain management and vaccine management may seem very different, um, they actually are inextricably linked. If you want to have a high coverage for COVID vaccination outcome, you have to have um, close coordination and synchronization of those efforts. So we ran that forum for about two years. We ended it in July of 2023 with a forum that brought people together in person for the first time um, and capped over two years of rich sharing of experience. So thank you very much. And now over to Anna. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, I guess I'll just stand here as well. Well, feel free to use the podium if you'd like. <laughs> Sounds good. Hi, everybody. So my name is Anna Kostake. Um, so consider this, um, my 86-year-old grandfather living in a small village in Romania called Guracalite. Um, our small village has one health center that caters to a population of about 2,000 people. And I'm sure that we all know small villages, there are millions of villages such as Guracalite around the world that really rely on a supply chain that works well and that is efficient in order to get vaccines to its people. So my talk today, as Rebecca mentioned, will be focusing on the work that we've done in supply chain to ensure that um, vaccines get to people in Niger safely and efficiently. So as we know, um, supply chains are complex. Well, supply chain for vaccines are especially complex. Vaccines have to be transported as well as stored at appropriate temperatures um, in order for them to be safe and effective. So during the COVID-19 vaccine pandemic, the supply chain had to make uh, incredible adjustments just to keep pace with the fast moving environment. Initially, vaccine supply was scarce, so countries were dealing with unpredictable supply. Later, once the vaccine supply became available, 
um, countries uh, had to adapt again to the introduction of a number of vaccine products that were um, each uh, requiring, uh, requiring um, different handling requirements. This also meant different storage requirements and needs which led to the introduction of what we call the ultra cold chain equipment, which was new for the country, as well as new investments in cold chain equipment at country level, really emphasizing the need for maintenance. Um, so our project really focused on ensuring that we can maximize that investment in cold chain equipment at country level by rethinking how do we approach maintenance of this cold chain equipment. So in Niger, we collaborated very closely with the Ministry of Health to relook at maintenance. We wanted to do so by uh, adapting a human-centered design approach. Uh, why? Because we wanted to speak with the stakeholders that were really involved in maintenance. So we spoke with immunization managers and logisticians that oftentimes are involved in planning and budgeting for maintenance. We spoke to, to with cold chain technicians that are specialized skilled workers that are often involved in repairs as well as corrective maintenance. We also spoke with health workers that are oftentimes um, involved in everyday upkeep of the equipment. So we learned a lot from these conversations about the challenges that Niger were, were facing with cold chain maintenance. And I wanna highlight that sometimes these challenges are often different than our assumptions at the global level of what the needs are for cold chain equipment maintenance. So one of the challenges that Niger highlighted was the need to prioritize and tailor cold chain maintenance training um, uh, to the different stakeholders. Oftentimes the maintenance um, is bundled as part of a larger immunization program and it becomes an afterthought. A second challenge that we um, uncovered was the absence of some clear guidelines. For example, guidelines on how, do, how can we use the temperature data that's collected on a daily basis at health facility to inform and make informed decisions about our cold chain uh, equipment maintenance. So Niger is exploring a couple of solutions, a couple of ideas on how to address these challenges. One of the, the ideas that they're exploring is tailored training. So for example, key people like healthcare workers can be trained on simple, uh, simple tasks, such as troubleshooting an equipment while they wait for a cold chain technician. Another idea that uh, Niger is exploring is the use of a platform a platform that, such as the IP Forum that we can exchange um, information, um, be able to connect, track, and share different guidelines among key stakeholders such as cold chain technicians. Why do we care and why does it matter? So cold chain equipment maintenance has been a long-standing issue and it will continue to be so way beyond COVID. So there's a real need to try to rethink how do we approach and how do we think about maintenance. Our work in Niger has been critical to try to maximize the investment that we have done in cold chain equipment um, and reach those in need with uh, vaccines. Our effort is also um, hoping to really elevate the visibility of the needs of cold chain maintenance. So in conclusion, thinking back at um, my grandfather's village, Kurakalitsi, and all the small villages, I think it's important for us to um, understand and communicate with these communities to understand their challenges and really involve them into the development of solutions. Thank you. I think now we'll have our video. Um, <laughs> with the remarks from Tedros Alamayehu. Hi, I am Tedros Alamayehu. I led the implementation of COVID-19 vaccination activities for the project in Ethiopia. I am going to share our innovative experience to successfully integrate COVID-19 vaccination into Mises' campaign. 
In December 2022, the Ministry of Health Ethiopia conducted an integrated measles vaccination campaign. Initially, the plan was to integrate vitamin A supplementation, deworming, identification, and vaccination of zero, zero dose children and other screening services on top of the measles vaccination. For Addis Ababa city, integration of COVID-19 vaccination with the measles campaign was not part of the plan. Recognizing the opportunity created due to the mass measles vaccination, our project worked with the Ministry of Health of Ethiopia and Addis Ababa city health bureau to integrate COVID-19 vaccination with the measles campaign. We held successive meetings with key decision makers within the Addis Ababa City Health Bureau to advocate on the need to integrate COVID-19 vaccination until a decision was made by the Bureau about the integration. Thanks to this integration, about 39,000 people were vaccinated with COVID-19 vaccine in Addis Ababa over a period of 10 days. These people would have been unvaccinated if COVID-19 vaccination was not integrated with the measles campaign. With the Ministry of Health, we put everything in place for all the integrated services, including training of health workers, availing supplies needed for all the integrated services, and printing and distribution of reporting and recording tools for each of the vaccination team. Communication and demand creation related activities were also part of the campaign. But looking at the data of the first few days, of, few days of the campaign, it seemed like some of the teams in one of the project support subsidy were still focusing mainly on measles vaccination. In those sites, very few people were getting vaccinated for COVID-19 vaccines. So we made visit to those sites to see what was happening. We saw that in those sites, clients could come through, their child would get registered, get weighted, provided with vitamin A, measles vaccine, and other screening service, but they missed to get information regarding the availability of COVID-19 vaccination. In one of the vaccination sites, we helped the vaccination team to rearrange the, the service station so that the COVID-19 information and vaccination was stationed in the middle of the vaccination post. This rearrangement helped each vaccination team to provide clear information to every client on COVID-19 vaccination before the client leaves the vaccination post. When we assessed the effect of this reorganization of the post, the uptake of COVID-19 vaccination in that health facility had increased. Using this learning as an evidence, we worked with the subsidy health offices and facilitated other health facilities to follow similar type of rearrangements of the vaccination sessions. With those changes to the flow of clients, you know what happened? The number of people that received COVID-19 vaccination increased more than double every single day. Prior to the reorganization of the client flow, an average of 351 people per day were getting COVID-19 vaccination, which increased to 841 people per day after the rearrangement of the client flow. That means there were 490 additional people per day that received the COVID-19 vaccination in the supported subsidy that was attributed to client flow rearrangement and provision of timely solution to the challenges that the vaccination team experienced during integration. We were able to provide advice on how to reorganize the flow of the service because the health officials we worked with trusted us. We had staff embedded at the ministry. We looked at the data and saw that things were not working as intended in the vaccination sites. And Together, we developed a, a solution that worked. As a result, integration happened successfully. Thank you for your time and attention. Bonjour. 
je vais vous parler d'une histoire, l'histoire de l'amélioration du système de données en RDC pour aider à atteindre plus de personnes vaccinées contre la COVID. C'est plus l'histoire d'une personne qui se retrouve que les choses ne marchent pas et qui doit changer, qui doivent changer d'orientation. Mais la question, pourquoi devons-nous nous intéresser aux données, au système de données Eh bien, parce que connaître le nombre de personnes vaccinées peut nous aider à savoir où les vaccinateurs doivent mener les vaccins, quelles sont les populations qui ont été oubliées, quelle dose la personne a reçu, en fait, de faire les messages de rappel. Mais également, ça nous permet de suivre les, les effets secondaires. Good morning. This is the story of improving data systems in the DRC to help reach more people with COVID vaccines. More broadly, it is the story of recognizing when something's not working and pivoting. It is Constant's story, but it was so many people's story during the pandemic that I'm very happy to be here to translate for Constant today. Why should we care so much about data or data systems? Data on how many people are vaccinated can help vaccinators know where to plan services, which populations are being missed, and to track side effects. La mise en place euh, du nouveau système euh, de données de vaccination contre la COVID a été l'un de, des nombreuses étapes que le gouvernement euh, a dû franchir pour euh, faire face à cette pandémie mo mondiale. Et l'introduction d'une nouvelle technologie, comme vous le savez, n'était pas facile parce qu'à l'époque, les utilisateurs devaient être formés, mais ils devaient être formés à distance à cause des mesures barrières. Tous les sites qui vaccinaient devaient avoir soit un ordinateur, soit une tablette, la, la connexion Internet, l'électricité, chose qui n'était pas, pas toujours facile. Comme de plus en plus les gens se faisaient vacciner, il devenait de plus en plus difficile pour saisir les données de toutes les personnes qui étaient vaccinées. As Constant said, building a new data system for COVID vaccines was one of the many milestones that governments had to achieve during this global pandemic. Introducing a new technology like this is not easy. Everyone needs a tablet, internet, and electricity. People needed to be trained, and this was during a time when we were trying to physically distance. As more people were getting vaccinated, it was becoming clearer that it was really difficult for health workers to, to keep up with the number of people's data they needed to enter. Dans une situation d'urgence, il est à des fois difficile de de se reposer, de réfléchir. Mais nous, grâce à notre projet, à notre approche de la co-création, nous avons quand même réfléchi, nous avons réuni le, les parties prenantes pour pouvoir réfléchir euh, aux problèmes que racontaient les, les utilisateurs pour le, les nouveaux systèmes. Donc nous avons réuni les parties prenantes, nous avons réfléchi aux défis qui rencontraient dans l'utilisation de la nouvelle technologie. Ainsi, à la fin de cet atelier de co-création, cela a permis de trouver des solutions durables, réalisables, par exemple, revenir à l'ancien système qui utilisait la vaccination des routines. Constant was mentioning that in an emergency, when so many things need to happen, it can be hard to pause and reflect. But our project was working side by side with vaccinators, and we saw their challenges using this new data systems technology. We didn't want to propose a Band-Aid solution. We wanted to use this as an opportunity to strengthen systems more broadly. So we brought together stakeholders in a workshop where we had evidence-informed discussions of the challenges, the health worker needs, and the broader digital health goals for the country. We looked at the entire system. This workshop co-created feasible solutions, such as going back to the system that was used for routine immunization. We thought, if we can make people's jobs easier, maybe we'll have more data to use. Constant, did the new system work? Oui, cela a marché. D'ailleurs, une évaluation qu'on a menée à Kinshasa a montré que les agents de santé étaient plus disposés à utiliser les, papiers, les, les formats papier bien simplifiés. Ils étaient plus... Euh, leur travail, étant donné que les, les outils étaient simplifiés, ils avaient moins de travail qu'auparavant. En plus, la complétude s'est améliorée. Et enfin, les utilisateurs pouvaient maintenant consulter les données à un seul endroit pour prendre des décisions afin d'améliorer la couverture vaccinale. Yes, it worked. 
An evaluation in Kinshasa showed that health workers were back to using simpler tools and processes and entering data into the same system they used for routine immunization. Their job was easier, so they were more likely to enter all of the data. Data completeness improved, and decision makers could now see all of the data in one place so that they could make decisions on where to set up services, for example. And this new, or old, approach is also helping to strengthen the broader routine immunization data systems. So Constant, what can we learn for the next pandemic? Je dirais trois choses. Premièrement, les nouvelles technologies doivent être adaptées à la réalité de chaque pays. On doit s'assurer que les investissements, les nouveaux investissements sont nécessaires en fait pour la RDC mais pour les autres pays également, hein, pour pour un environnement favorable à la santé, à la santé numérique, pour bien nous préparer à la prochaine euh, urgence. Mais également, les, les investissements d'urgence peuvent conduire à un renforcement hein, des systèmes de façon plus large, à long terme, hein, s'ils sont conçus à, à, à cet effet. Mais parfois, euh, on dit, il faut parfois faire une pause et réfléchir. Constant shared some excellent lessons. First, new technologies should be adapted to each country's reality. Make sure the solution fits the context, is designed around end user needs, and builds on existing systems and skills. Second, it is so important to have a strong digital health enabling environment before a pandemic hits. More investment is needed in DRC and elsewhere so that we're even more prepared for the next emergency. Third, Emergency investments can lead to longer-term system strengthening if you design them to do so. And Constant noted that this is why it's so important to pause and reflect. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of our excellent lightning speakers. Um, so as I had mentioned, we're really excited. We have a world premiere video here today. Um, it just came off the production line. Um, I think it's a great way to bring to life uh, the work that we do in, in, uh, across all of our countries. Um, and while that's playing, I invite um, our panelists to please come up to the stage. Momentum Routine Immunization Transformation and Equity is a six-year USAID-funded project designed to address entrenched obstacles to immunization and increase equitable immunization coverage. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic, new vaccines were developed in record time. It became clear by early 2021 that vaccination would be a critical tool to control the pandemic, minimize deaths, and help us all return to normal life. Beginning in 2021, the project worked in 18 countries with diverse contexts to support the rapid scale-up of life-saving COVID-19 vaccines. This was an extraordinary global health effort on a scale never seen before. Multiple vaccines were introduced simultaneously, each requiring different storage, handling, and administration. Rapid rollout of COVID-19 vaccines approved for emergency use gave rise to rumors, misinformation, and vaccine hesitancy. Maximizing public health impact and reducing deaths meant finding ways to reach priority groups, such as older adults, who had not previously been the focus of vaccination efforts. The project worked with global leaders, including WHO and UNICEF, to help develop guidance for countries on vaccine introduction, including planning the delivery of COVID-19 vaccines, training health workers, cold chain management, and communicating the vaccine safety and importance to the public. In India, the project worked with the national government and 18 state governments to vaccinate hard-to-reach populations. Working with local non-governmental organizations, the project employed all necessary means, including boats and camels, to reach even the most remote communities. 
the project worked with local leaders, including religious leaders, to champion vaccination and build public trust in the vaccines. The project also helped state governments monitor vaccine stocks, evenly distributing vaccines based on real-time usage. The project helped administer 15.6 million vaccine doses, including 6 million clients from vulnerable groups. In Nigeria, the project worked with five states to support campaigns that vaccinated over 2.9 million people. The project's support included identifying strategic sites for vaccination, training health workers, and publicizing the campaign through multiple channels. The project helped countries communicate information about the vaccine in ways that would be accepted by the community. In Serbia, North Macedonia and Moldova, that meant creating a public messaging campaign that highlighted vaccination as part of a healthy lifestyle. In DRC and Mozambique, it meant working with community leaders, including religious leaders, to provide information on vaccine safety. The project brought new partners into the COVID-19 vaccination effort to leverage community networks to identify vaccination barriers and solutions, especially to reach high priority groups such as older populations, those with disabilities and marginalized groups. New partnerships in Kenya and India leveraged civil society organizations to help vaccinate the high priority group of older adults against COVID-19. As of October 2023, the project has trained 145,000 health professionals on COVID-19 related topics, reached 372 million people with COVID-19 vaccination messaging, and directly supported the vaccination of 21 million people. As countries work to integrate COVID-19 vaccination into other primary healthcare services, the project continues to apply innovative strategies from COVID-19 vaccination to strengthen routine immunization. So I, I hope everyone enjoyed that. I don't know if there's a category of short documentary at the Oscars, but <laughs> I'll look into it. Um, so it's a great honor for me to introduce our esteemed panel today. Uh, we have, and I will introduce them not exactly in the order that they're seated, but uh, uh, they have nameplates so you can see. Uh, Dr. B. N. Rajani, who's the Deputy Director Immunization from the Directorate of Health and Family Welfare Services in Karnataka State in India. Hi, everyone. I also have Dr. Maria Johannes Uzoma, the Executive Secretary of the Emo State Primary Healthcare Development Agency in Nigeria. Hello. We're also joined by Momentum Routine Immunization Transformation and Equities Country Leads from India, Kenya, Mozambique, and Nigeria. So Dr. G.K. Sony is our country lead in India. Hello. Dr. Betuel Sigauke, our country lead in Mozambique. Hi, everyone. Uh, Dr. Isaac Mugoya, our country lead in Kenya. Hello, everyone. And Dr. Yakubu Chirima, our country lead in Nigeria. Good day, everyone. So we have questions prepared for our panelists, but before I begin, I wanted to just sort of remind everyone, as, as Rebecca did, of what was happening in 2021 when we started our work. It was a time when things were really <coughs> changing very rapidly. There were waves of infection in different parts of the world at different times. Perceptions around vaccination and the risk of the disease were changing really rapidly. And also vaccine supply was really unpredictable. MRIGHT started its work in Kenya and Mozambique in mid-2021 and later that year in India. Our work in Nigeria didn't begin until 2022. And over time, countries faced different challenges based on the status of COVID-19 infections, whether there were a lot of cases at the time, whether people were fearful of COVID or tired of COVID. We'll talk with our panel today about the challenges to vaccination, how they overcame those challenges, and what we can learn from that experience to strengthen routine immunization. So my first question I want to pose to uh, Dr. Dr. Mugoya and Dr. Sigauke. Um, when vaccine rollout began in 2021, 
What were some of the key challenges that you were facing and how did you respond to them? Uh, I'm Isaac. When vaccination began in 2021, one of the biggest challenge was that we are now vaccinating a group that we were not vaccinating and we had no experience. And this posed several challenges. One challenge was the challenge of strategy. Which strategy did we use to get into these groups? The second challenge we faced was challenge of determining denomination, denominator. We had priority groups, but one individual could fit into several categories of those priority groups, and therefore it was very difficult to say that we have an accurate denominator. Also, there was no data existing for these different groups of people, and therefore we really had to quickly identify ways <coughs> and means of looking at these data. The third challenge we had was the how do we manage data? from this kind of vaccination of a group of heterogeneous group of people. Several things were done in my country. One of the things that we used was existing registry. Registry for non-communicable diseases, cancer disease, uh, HIV, and other diseases. And then we also realized that these registries were incomplete. So we still needed to improve on them, and that is a still a work that is going on. For data, one of the things that we realized that with the introduction of electronic system, people face the challenge of not having a, enough data bundles to be able to upload because it's supposed to be an online system, to be supposed to be live, but if you don't upload data on time, that data is not becoming useful. So what the project did in one of the counties that we supported was to be able to provide data bundles for the counties and to be able to ensure that the data backlog that was there was uploaded. In one county, we had up to 80,000 data entries that were not entered. People vaccinated, but not available. And this, when we hired, when we hired clerks to do this and provided data bundles, this largely improved the coverage of that county and helped to improve the county because this county was one of the counties with largest population in the country. So those are some of the things that were done in Kenya. I would want to hear from Mozambique as well. My name is Abed. Well, the country uh, program, uh, country project lead. I would like to add some of challenges that we also faced in Mozambique during COVID pandemic. Two of them are related with misinformation, and the second one is the shortage of uh, COVID vaccines. So as you may know, the perception around of um, uh, the vaccine has been characterized by narrative that shows uh, the distrust uh, in relation to the safety and efficacy of COVID vaccines. So the project has dedicated for a social uh, mobilization with a key message to uh, explain that there are uh, more benefits with the vaccination than the risk. So the social mobilization also uh, was complemented by uh, engagement of uh, leadership from all level at community level and also at um, government, uh, government at national level. Uh, in relation to the shortage of vaccines, we uh, know that the limited of uh, vaccine supply in large quantity for it's important to uh, prepare a better planning for vaccine service and uh, a, a strategy for delivering the services. So in regard of this, uh, the project has supported uh, in regular planning, but also active coordination across partner to align and complement complementary across the different tasks, which uh, some of them are related with vaccine distribution, communication about eligibility of uh, target groups, and also service delivery. Uh, also, uh, the project has contributed to the prioritization based on high-risk population, initially for health workers and um, um, people with comor comorbidity and also the uh, uh, adults. So thank you from now. Thank you, Isaac Mbetwell. 
Maybe I can turn to Dr. Rajani. We heard about some of the challenges around um, estimating the, the population size, around distrust. What were some of the challenges that were faced in Karnataka, and how did you overcome them? Yeah, thank you. I'm Dr. Rajani. I'm State Immunization Officer from the state of Karnataka, one of the states in southern India. We do have a good health system. And after, during the COVID pandemic, when the COVID vaccination was rolled out, um, we were uh, in a fast pace. We were able to reach out to nearly 92% of the population with first dose and 87% with second dose. But we always agree that the last mile coverage is always a problem. The initial 70% is fairly good enough. We move at a fast pace. And next, another 20% is always a difficulty. So in our state, reaching this last mile had some challenges. It was at this time that there was a need to speed up, scale up, and strategize the efforts in improving the coverage with the uh, threat of the COVID-19 pandemic. So there were some selected groups like, like the vulnerable population, the marginalized population, like the tribal people, migrants, laborers, and the elderly group, who usually do not come under our regular covered population. That means to say they are traditionally the unreached population. So to reach out to them, this project came as a very handy thing to us. We were supported by a state team at the state level and with the support of the local NGOs, uh, we were able to tailor out, culturally tailored, tailored strategies to address these issues. These NGOs were selected on the basis of their roots which was already persisted. They were working in the community for other different health services. So their a base, their uh, coordination with the local stakeholders came as a boon to us. So the adopted strategies were like, since they knew these vulnerable population, like working with the elderly people or the uh, HIV people, people with disabilities and all, they knew these people. So they were mapped into our micro plan. That became the first step of getting them vaccinated. The second challenge was reaching out to the unreached. We agree that these people with disabilities or the elderly people, they cannot come to the vaccination sites. So the mobile vaccination vans were provided so that our team moved, uh, the project supported us in this way, our team moved to the houses. We had house-to-house -house vaccination. Near-to-home vaccination were also uh, planned. And uh, in needy cases, they were mobilized to the vaccination centers. So that was the implementation aspect. And the third aspect is addressing the vaccine hesitancy and refusal. There are various uh, linguistic and uh, um, barriers, cultural barriers, which prevented them to get themselves uh, access to the vaccination. So we took the support of the uh, leaders, that is faith-based organizations, the civil service, uh, civil society organizations. So the project team uh, helped as a bridge between the government and the community. There were community stakeholder meetings, uh, street plays were made. They were all communication strategies were really uh, tailored so that it could reach to these people. I could quote an example in one of the districts uh, the, dealing with the private, uh, tribal people. Their people, they never used to uh, get themselves vaccinated. And whenever our team moved there, they found out that because of alcoholism, many men were alcoholics there, the family was dependent on the male person in the family to give their consent to get the family vaccinated. But the person, the male person would always be under the influence of the alcohol. So this was a real task for our team. So the project uh, supported HR, they moved to them, they moved to the community, they were able to reach out to the time when they were not under the influence of the alcohol, convince them and get the family vaccinated. This is one just example, like how uh, we were able to reach out to them. And next is the aspect of this uh, uh, digital literacy. 
India had the COVID digital platform. So mandatorily, we were support to, supposed to record the vaccination on this COVID registration, uh, the same. So the project supported us in uh, capacity building of the health workers. They moved from house to house. They understood that because the people were under the idea that they have to mandatorily register themselves online. And uh, that's why they didn't access the vaccination. So the project people, uh, they talked to those people in person. Interpersonal communication skills were adapted. And uh, they were convinced about the need for vaccination. And uh, they were moved to the nearest vaccination sites, helped out in getting themselves uh, on spot registered and got them vaccinated. And the important strategy what we adapted was the data-driven approach. As I already mentioned, we had the digital platform. So we, we utilized this, we got the feedback out of this platform, we analyzed, and there were two situations. One, the, when the project uh, stepped in, there was a demand for vaccination, and the strategic utilization of the vaccines was done. And the, at the fag end, there was no need, the threat perception had reduced, but the vaccines were already uh, piled up in the COVID vaccination centers uh, with the short shelf life. So we had to create demand again for the second dose or the precaution dose. And that's how this worked out. Thank you. Dr. Rajani. So maybe I can turn, turn to Dr. Sony. So we heard about the challenges in Karnataka and how they were addressed. But what about nationwide? We were tasked with working in 18 states. How did that large mandate affect the strategy that you took? Thank you, Grace. I'm Dr. G.K. Soni. I'm the project director for India, GSI India office. So rightly mentioned by, by Dr. Rajni that there are many challenges the state had faced. So similar challenges were there in the, across the country when we are working in all the 18 states. So basically the challenges are on the both side, the supply side as well as the demand side. So in supply side, when the vaccine program was rolled out, there were limited supply of the vaccine because the production was limited. So there was indigenous vaccines which government of India has used and there was a limited supply and that has to be judicially used in the country. So we have to take care of all the supply challenges what were there from manufacturer reaching to the last mile, each and everywhere the supply has to be tracked. Similarly, in supply chain, the human resources were engaged in disease surveillance also. They are doing the pandemic surveillance also. So there was a fatigue factor in the human resources also who are worked for the vaccination program. Secondly, during that pandemic, everyone has faced, either in their family members or they themselves have faced the pandemic effects and the disease fear what Dr. Rajni has mentioned. So definitely there was a fear factor also. There is eagerness for the vaccination also. Then we have the geographical challenges. Country has wide variety of geographical challenges. The Northeast states have different challenges. The Southern states have different challenges. The Eastern has different. The North part has the different challenges. So we are working across the country. I think the 18 states, what we are covering, that covers nearly one third of the population of the country where we have supported with the project activities. And we have supported nearly 300 districts out of the 700 dis 750 districts in the country. So that means one third of the districts we have already covered with the project geography, and that was a lot of support what the project has given in the country. So geographical challenges were there, human resources were, uh, challenges were there, then implementation challenges were there. Vaccine was available, how to reach the last mile. Because the, during the lockdown, transportation was also one of the challenge. So at that particular moment, we have to work with the government system. Whatever the challenges are there, we have to provide that. Secondly, there was vaccine hesitancy, like Dr. Rajni has mentioned. Vaccine hesitancy was there because it was a new vaccine. No one was aware uh, regarding the fear of the AFIs were there, adverse event following vaccination. So there was fear even the health workers also when the vaccine was initially launched. So we have to take care of all these activities and different manners in different states, different strategies were adopted. For this, we have engaged 26 local NGOs, what Dr. Rajni had mentioned, in every state they have supported for community mobilization activities, interpersonal communication activities, so that the myths and misinformation which was there in the field and the community was broken. So there are multiple activities which are connected and there was crisis. So we have to do whatever we do as early as possible, the speed and scale. So onboarding of these NGOs 
orientation of the NGOs, health workers also. It's a very tedious job for us. And ongoing, immediately when the project was started, it was in the middle of the pandemic. So we have to onboard our own human resources for the project activities as well as for the NGOs also. And bring them on the board because the program was evolving in the phased manner. In country, it was not like that we have started the vaccination for entire age groups. It was in the phased manner. When the program was started in January 2021, it was with the health workers and the frontline workers. Then they added the high priority groups, the 60 plus, then 45 plus, then 18 plus, then 12 plus. And similarly, the vaccines were also rolled out in the country in the phase manner. Initially, there were one or two vaccines when we started the program. Then the vaccines approvals were taken care and they were added in the program. So, so many things were going on in the program. Every time the health worker needs to be oriented, we have to align ourselves with the government of India's priorities or state government priorities. So, multiple capacity building trainings have been done. Like Dr. Rajniya mentioned, there was a detailed platform that was also evolving over a period of time. For the first time, because country has a large population in the uh, geographical area, one-sixth of the world's population is there in the India. So we have to cover, we have to enlist each and every beneficiary for the vaccination. So the digital platform, what we have used, we have to orient the teams, we have to create the awareness in the community how to use the digital platform. Like one of the examples she has quoted. So similarly, there are multiple challenges and the project has aligned themselves with the priorities of the government of India and the state governments to support all these activities. So data analysis was one of the component also to identify the pockets where is the low coverage. The vaccine distribution needs to be planned where is the maximum consumptions. Or where is it? So multiple activities has happened during this activities. So I think we have aligned ourselves in the project geographies for the demand as well as supply chain challenges, whatever we have faced with the support of our local NGOs, our organizations we have engaged in the field. So that's all. Thank you, Dr. Sony. Um, so, Dr. Uzoma, I'm sure you face some similar challenges also in Emo State, but I wonder if you could speak to what were some of the most important factors that really change the trajectory of COVID-19 vaccination, moving Emo from a lower coverage state to the high, one of the highest in the country. Okay, thank you. Um, early 2022, Emo State was third to the last on the national dashboard for COVID-19 vaccination. And that was less than 6% coverage. <clears throat> so this uh, was just because we didn't have uh, enough partner uh, support. Although we had good uh, political will, our government, released all the necessary counterpart fund for the implementation of COVID-19. And he even launched two separate uh, um, flag of, I said, launching ceremonies for flag of, uh, for COVID-19 to improve awareness and uh, uptake. He was, he came out to be vaccinated at the public glare with his wife and other top government officials. However, he didn't do the magic. But when the project came, they worked on our strategic uh, coordinating forum. They strengthened it. At the time, it was sort of moribund. So they, we were able to have regular meetings. And they also worked on awareness creation using different uh, media platforms and uh, stakeholders' engagement. And this actually helped even some of our traditional leaders opened up their policies for, for use for uh, COVID vaccination sites. And uh, we were able to uh, penetrate the campuses. We did campus vaccination. Uh, market storm uh, prisons, just because we were able to get the buy-in of the uh, the leadership of these institutions, so they also strengthened our operation data room by giving out laptops uh, and uh, data bundles to our MNEs at the state level and the LGA levels, so we were able to upload and harmonize um, 
our electronic and uh, calling data. They also helped in improving the number of mobile teams. And those mobile teams did a wonderful job. They were all over the place. Wherever we had any gathering, call it uh, weddings, uh, funerals, or cultural events, they will be there, counseling and uh, vaccinating. For hard to reach areas and uh, community, uh, security compromised areas, we uh, employed vaccinating team, teams from and monitors from those areas because they know the terrain. And um, we were able to also uh, organize some uh, medical outreaches where we gave out routine drugs such as over-the-counter drugs and uh, anti-malaria drugs to those who come for to be vaccinated. So, uh, and at other times, the project facilitated the transportation of those who are at the area of um, high-risk areas to be transported to where uh, there is safety for vaccination. So I would say that with enabling environment by created by the government, his distinguished Senator Hope Ozodima, the governor of Imo State, and the support we got on coordination and demand creation, plus the hard work of our health workers. They really were fantastic. So we were able to rise from less than 6% to 70% within five months of the presence of the project in the state. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uzoma. Um, maybe I can turn to Dr. Yakubu. So Dr. Uzoma mentioned the government commitment, the coordination, demand creation. Based on all that was done for COVID-19, what are the lessons around those types of strategies for routine immunization? Thank you, Grace. I think when COVID-19 COVID struck, the entire human race was brought to its knees. And I think if we are not careful with the next pandemic, uh, we may not stand. However, we need to document every lesson that we have identified and deployed in this response in the current response was COVID-19 to uh, prepare for the next pandemic. I know throughout the project life cycles from planning, implementation, budgeting, monitoring, and even execution of COVID-19 response at different contexts, there are key vulnerabilities. We, we are vulnerable in terms of uh, comorbidity, in terms of the financial resources in terms of strategic partnership that will support uh, the coordination of the response. And uh, we've seen in Nigeria a clear and significant and very striking uh, disruption caused by COVID-19. The vaccine preventable disease uh, diphtheria in Nigeria that uh, ravaged Nigeria do, uh, just after the uh, COVID-19 uh, response. So uh, I think um, one of the things we have learned in Nigeria is that bringing people into one room with diverse opinion, with different strength across uh, the project life cycle helps uh, to coordinate the entire response. And we have seen how different partners amplified uh, their synergies, e information exchange, as well as uh, joint planning to execute uh, um, the COVID-19 response. Uh, in Nigeria, specifically, we have the national uh, response. The commitment from the political class was classic. And um, we had our president uh, leading uh, the presidential tax force and making bold commitment. I think it is this bold political commitment and even recognizing that uh, we have a problem at hand 
is critical for us to prepare for the next uh, pandemic and to also activate our response uh, effectively. The other uh, lesson we need to document or we need to note is that if we are able to penetrate the community level, engage in a co-creative um, manner with key beneficiaries to identify, prioritize, as well as um, deploy or agree on possible solutions that they will own, I think uh, we are going to mount and also prepare against a future uh, pandemic. A key lesson, again, we recognize uh, very strongly in Nigeria is about data. How we use data, how we collect data, the timing is critical. In Nigeria, we, the country or the presidential uh, tax for some COVID-19 response initially agreed on a specific uh, response, I mean, approach, which is fixed sessions in health facilities. But we found out that the numbers were not coming in because it will take you an active process for you to go to a health facility to assess care and also get the COVID jab on your arm. So data provided the opportunity for us to now re rejig the, our approach. And we expanded to outreaches as well as mobile uh, uh, services. And we started getting the numbers coming in. But that goes beyond uh, just getting the numbers. The numbers, we, the government created a platform. That platform was an electronic platform from the field, and it was assessed across all the different health uh, levels. And uh, feedbacks were provided real time to um, the uh, guys in the field. And at the end, corrections were made, outliers were identified quickly, and operational challenges were resolved immediately. And the government have taken that as a serious lesson, and we have now agreed as a national system to deploy that EMIT platform, which is an electronic management of uh, immunization data uh, for routine immunization and PHC services. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to pick up on one thing that you have mentioned, which is around bringing um, diverse people together, uh, and pose my next question to Dr. Mugoya and Dr. Sigaoke. Um, how did the pro pro project work to facilitate partnerships uh, with between the government and new types of partners? And what did they contribute? Uh, thank you, Grace. Uh, in Kenya, the project identified a, a, a local CSO called ACF, standing for Aging Concern Foundation. This is a CSO that uh, advocates for the welfare of elderly people. They didn't have any intervention that has to do with health, leave alone immunizations. But they also they have the elderly people organizing what we call older people associations, OPS, which they use, they meet regularly. When we looked at their model, we realized that they could provide some few things for us to be able to reach these populations. One is a trust that these old people had in the, these organizations. And because of this, it was easier for us to use ACF to be able to advocate, educate, and also get feedback from old people on immunizations, as well as get their concerns about why they were not getting vaccination, vaccinated and what can be done to help them get vaccinated. The second thing they brought is also the platform, the new platform that we didn't know that existed, the OPS. They were already organized. They meet regularly every month to discuss several things. With this also came another partnership that we really had not seen. In Kenya, you have a program for welfare of the elderly people. Every month they get a step aid from the government and they meet at the banks. So ACF was able to confuse the banks to provide a tent when these elderly people come to collect their stipend to be able to collect to be vaccinated. And therefore, we were able to partner with the banks <laughs> Uh, in ex an accession beyond ACF. So our association, our partnership with ACF also catalyzed another partnership with the banks. In as much as we were not the one who were acting directly with the, with, the, with the banks. So from this experience, we also brought in the county government to work with the, with the ACF. And what they did is that the ACF would, do, would mobilize the old people. They would talk to them, they would educate them, 
and they would convince them to come for vaccinations. And then the county government would provide the vaccines and they would also provide the human resources to be able to do that. So this is one of the collaborations that we saw we, we saw being created from a partnership that we, we got into with ACF and they were able to create with the banks and the county government, independent of us. And we think that is something that will help us to be able to reach a high coverage in those in particular areas that we worked in within that particular time. So there are some few things that we learned that as people in the immunizations, we also need to be open to partnership and see what other people are able to provide look at a new platform that a partner can come with and be able to use those platforms to be able to vaccinate and also allow the partners to be able to look at the other partnership that they can work on. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. In Mozambique, uh, the project also have actively engaged in identification of non-traditional health partners. And we have successfully identified um, a confederation of business association. That um, association have previously contributed in terms of vaccine supply because they have um, they have uh, bought a vaccine and to uh, distribute for the uh, different uh, affiliated company. And we engage uh, this association in order to allow to use the platform to access the affiliated company in order to improve the access of vaccination to the workers and jointly with the family. So with this platform, we have successfully increased uh, the number of, uh, of uh, uh, increased the uptake of the vaccines. And because of this experience, we are continuing uh, looking engagement of other different um, uh, partners in order also to improve uh, routine immunization um, uh, service delivery. We know that there are so many needs and those non-traditional partners have really important uh, role in the uh, vaccine uptake. So these include now in terms of mapping a local organization uh, for outsourcing transport to facilitate uh, the implementation of routine immunization mobile brigade, which is one of the limitation in terms of uh, reaching community, especially hard to reach community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, maybe I can turn back to Dr. Rajani now. Um, if, based on your experience working with new types of partners, what do you think they can add to improving routine immunization? Uh, well, uh, with the immunization partners who are already working with us, um, and the new partner which we had, that is the project partner uh, for this COVID vaccination. I can take off three examples what was done in Karnataka. The first thing is uh, hepatitis B bird dose coverage in private sectors. So we utilized this opportunity of this project team. We deployed them to the various private hospitals to understand why the reporting of the hepatitis B vaccination is poor in the private sector. And these private sectors form a major chunk in the uh, metropolitan cities. So the, this study gave an insight as to what has to be done to improve the coverage of hepatitis B bird dose vaccination, be it the capacity building for the pediatricians, the mandatory reporting, and the cold chain aspect was also uh, studied. And the second thing is, uh, now, globally, we are committed towards measles rubella elimination, and so also is our country, where we need to vaccinate children uh, with both the doses with more than 95% of measles rubella vaccine. So simultaneously, when the COVID vaccination was in a declining trend, at that time, uh, during the last November, we started with the measles rubella elimination activities. So we utilized this opportunity the uh, grassroots level coordination which these uh, the local NGOs had and we were able to identify when they moved to the families we were able to identify the children of zero to five years who were not who had not received either a single or two doses of measles rubella vaccination and that's how the MR vaccination also ramped up 
And the third thing is, uh, in India, we recently uh, concluded with the Mission Indradhanush. It's a program to vaccinate all the children who are due for any dose, uh, who are missed or dropped out. Uh, so during the three rounds, the learning which we got uh, during COVID vaccination, we had identified certain influences who can influence a group or a community to get themselves vaccinated. So these influences who helped during the COVID-19 vaccination were also a great support in making this Mission Indrasanush program also successful. So these are some uh, three examples which uh, I thought I would quote. So uh, working with the partners and the new partners uh, which we did during the COVID-19 vaccination, it has necessitated the need for exploring the new approaches uh, which can be leveraged into addressing the routine immunization equity. So uh, we feel that these partners can prioritize the healthcare delivery. They can act as a bridge between government and the civil society organizations. And moving forward, the immunization program is expanding like anything. Uh, we are getting the newer vaccines uh, into the schedule, be it the HPV vaccination or uh, we already have the school vaccination, the TD, uh, and then influenza vaccine probably and typhoid vaccine. We don't know. Many vaccines are coming up. So I think the role of partners uh, will be very important in supporting the government. Uh, and then... Uh, they can support us in strengthening the uh, coordination at the grassroots level, which I already mentioned, because the local NGOs play a very good role in um, establishing the coordination with the stakeholders at the grassroots level, which becomes very important. So these partners can act as a catalyst in strengthening this routine immunization activity. So this is at the lower level, but it, when it comes to the higher level, uh, partners can play a very important role in guiding the policy makers, uh, be it in terms of funding or uh, the expertise which can be utilized in their uh, of their various domains in addressing the equity in relation to routine immunization. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for that. I, I'm going to move away from partners for a little bit to talk about uh, Dr. Sony and Dr. Yakubu. You both mentioned um, about misinformation during the pandemic. Can you talk a bit about what we've learned about how to tailor communications to different groups in order to address any concerns that they have and how what, what have we learned that would be useful for routine immunization? Really, misinformation was one of the main barrier for the vaccination program, COVID vaccination program. And there are multiple myths and misinformation floating in the field. And social media was one of the at, uh, pro platform which has flare up is like anything. So it has just flare up like wildfire. So we have to counteract those misinformation and myths which are floating through the social media, especially in urban areas where the vaccination needs to be there. So definitely the strategies were planned accordingly how to provide right information and with the right platform. So right messages were drafted by the team members and in consultation with the state government, the national government, which were again floated through the social media and the government of uh, state government's platforms were used to float these messages, to pass the right messages, because citizens rely on the government system messaging. So the same channel of the government system was used to provide right message, and right messenger platforms were used to provide the information in this community. Secondly, various strategies have been deployed for community engagement and community mobilization to break this in misinformation and in a myths in the community. So we are trying, we have tried to uh, identify the local influencers in the community, the local people, the community, Panchayati Raj institution was one of the public relative uh, information system which are there. We identify the local leaders in that community. We identify the ambassadors in the community who can pass on the correct message in that particular geographical area. So in different geographies, we different identify uh, different level of influencers who can help us to pass on these messages. Secondly, we engaged faith-based organizations. So citizens have the faith on their religious leaders also. So we identified different religious leaders who are the head of those religions to pass on the correct message, inform the community regarding the correct messages and for awareness regarding the vaccination. So the faith-based organization, like Dr. Rajni has mentioned, we have identified those faith-based leaders in that community from the different religions and they come together 
to provide the correct messages in that area. So over the period of time when the program was evolving, multiple activities have happened and we have strategized ourselves to act according to those areas. In some of the areas, we identify the local ambassador, like for the transgender community, the champions were identified that area. The young youth leaders, when the program was started for the 12 plus, we identified the youth leaders in the community or some role models who are, can pass on the correct message. So different strategies were engaged for the different activities in that area. Secondly, we did some dip stick also to identify the behavior and insight of the community. That was the behavior and uh, social drivers from where we also get some information and accordingly we plan our activities. So there was intent to get the vaccination in the community, but there were challenges where to reach, how to reach the vaccination sites. There were inaccessibility was one of the challenge. So either the vaccination uh, team were provided a vaccination in those particular geographical areas or those citizens are brought to the session sites. So the area we are trying to break that barriers also for the inaccessibility. Then there was other linguistic areas. Some ma'am have mentioned that also. So language problems are there. So understanding the local languages, the tribal community, multiple linguistic languages, the so local IC material was contextualized in that language so that they can understand it properly. So we have translated those messages in that particular geography area. State government has supported a lot for that, floating those messages. Because as such, we don't have the social media platforms, but we utilize the social media platforms of the state governments. So that has helped us for that particular area. Then the daily wagers, they are having the loss of wages in that particular area. So we try to organize the camps in the labor as industrial area itself so that there will no loss of wages or we convince the organization heads to free them for the uh, vaccination program. So we have tried multiple approaches to reach this uh, community areas. In, in schools, we have tried to get the school camps also. Then some of the workplaces, we have tried to do the workplaces campaigns also. So based on the local situation and need of the program, we have evolved our strategies to create awareness and to break this misinformation. Thank you. Thank you. Do Dr. Yakubu, do you want to add a bit to that? My, my friend and brother here um, in India is almost the replica of what is obtainable in Nigeria. But the key message I have is that we've learned over in Nigeria is that there is no silver bullet communication strategy or product, you know, that will uh, address the different concerns of uh, the multiple uh, individuals affected or impacted by this disease. Uh, from the early onset of that, I mean the COVID-19 vaccination, the messages were tailored towards risk perception and also the need for uh, uh, social distancing to avoid, uh, to prevent the disease. And as vaccines were introduced, the message changed. So um, all the, all, I mean, the different context of the individuals and also their particular needs needs to be factored when uh, tailoring such messages. That's, thank you. Minutes before we break for questions from the audience, but I wanted to address my last question um, to Dr. Uh, Mugoya and Dr. Uzoma. You know, we've heard mention of engaging with different communities, community leaders to try to reach key population groups. What have we learned about community engagement for COVID 19 that really is needed for routine immunization and any other future health emergencies? Maybe Isaac, you can start. Yeah, thank you, Grace. One of, the th one of the lessons that we learned with COVID-19 is that uh, when it comes to community engagement, the biggest thing that we should aim at is uh, community ownership. And ownership does two things. The community looks itself as a, a source, a provider of the solution, not just a consumer of our, of our solutions. We need to look at the community engagement two ways, both to create demand and also for service delivery. In Kenya, we learned this when we were working with some very informal groups. We worked with the two groups of, uh, that were part of the priority groups. One of them was uh, motorcycle riders. You may think that because they have motorcycles, they are able to get to facilities. But this, you need to understand that the motorcycles are not for their own mobility. They are, they are a source of income for them. 
And therefore, they are faced with this challenge of wanting to earn an income and coming for immunizations. So they are not coming for immunizations. So when we engage them, we, we are able to come to a point where by they told us the problem is not, is not that we don't want to come. We don't have time to come. So what can we do? And as we discussed with them, they proposed a solution that worked very well for them, that they could mobilize their colleagues, they, they know where they can meet, where they wait for clients, and then the project together with the, with the county government that was supporting would provide the solution and come and get them vaccinated. So they provided a solution that we had actually not thought about. The second example is when we worked with the farm workers. Farm workers could not get permission to come to get vaccinated but they offered to uh, negotiate with their managers, with the employers, so that they can get time off within the farm so that we can go to the farms and vaccinate them within the farms. And because of that, they were not so much, they did not spend much time away from the farms, but they also got what, they need, what we need them to get. So this taught us that when you are doing community engagement, we need to engage with the community and look at tapping into their powers to be able to identify solutions that work for them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, community engagement is really a necessary step in the introduction of any vaccine program or any PSC programs to the community because we need their buy-in. We need them to own the program for it to succeed. Community engagement is a time, is a forum for dialogue, not the time to just dish out information, whether they understand it or not. It's a time to allow them to ask questions, a time to clarify issues. When a vaccine is introduced, people will be worried about the safety of the vaccine and they want to know the benefit. It's a time to give the necessary benefits, clarifications, the clarification on the safety of that vaccine. So once they are able to understand the, what they will gain, they will now give their informed consent. And they will be the ones to go to the communities to mobilize. You know, they will now take, take up on the program and uh, you'll be sure that it will uh, succeed. So we use community engagement in, during COVID vaccine. Actually, it was a time that it was heightened. We've been doing uh, immunization activities, but we've never had it the way we had it during COVID vaccine. And uh, people came out, they became part of what we are doing, and uh, communication channels opened. So they know where we are going for um, any vaccination. They know the time and the, you know the location, so they feel part of what we are doing. They now sometimes if 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 we don't come around, they will call, make a call. Are you not coming? We are expecting you at the marketplace, and you are not here. You know, so you know everybody is part of what what is the uh, the program, and so you'll be sure that it 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 will succeed. So community engagement is a necessary key step in introducing any vaccine or any program if you want it to succeed. Thank you. Thank you both for such um, eloquent and really uh, uh, driving home that very important point for all of us. So, uh, uh, you know, time really flies we're, and we're having a great discussion. Uh, I'll just take about 10 minutes for a couple questions if there are. Maybe first uh, to Catherine. Great. Thank you so much for this great panel and, and insights. Um, my name is Catherine Bliss. I'm from CSIS. And I just wanted to ask each of you to reflect a, a little bit more. Some of you have mentioned it, but just on the gender dynamics uh, associated with um, both mobilizing and deploying health workers to deliver vaccines, but also in, in reaching adults in particular uh, with vaccines you know, during this period. Um, just wondering um, you know, how did uh, reaching out to, to adults differ um, in terms of gender dynamics than reaching out to, to parents of young children? Dr. Rajani, you spoke a little bit about some of the challenges around gaining male consent in, in the tribal communities, but you know, just wondering if 
if that conversation with um, with adults around you know had a different gender dynamic. Uh, also about vaccine confidence, was there messaging um, you know around gender issues, the rumors that circulated, you know, were there different approaches that needed to be considered, and then. Finally, some of you mentioned digital literacy and you know, just thinking about differences between men and women in terms of access to digital tools. You know, did that also play a role in shaping the COVID-19 vaccine delivery and, and what lessons might there be for the routine work? So, thanks. Thanks for that excellent question. Do we want to take another one before I pose that to the panel? Okay, does anyone? Oh. Thanks, everyone, for such an interesting discussion and panel. This is Nida Parks from USAID's Global Health Bureau. Um, so maybe I would just love to know if there was one innovation um, that COVID-19 investments and work has given you that you plan to or hope to carry forward um, apart from COVID. So whether it's something that you know was an innovation that now serves your um, routine immunization systems better, or it was an innovation that now um, allows you to do disease surveillance and pandemic preparedness better, but was there one thing that jumps to anyone's mind that really was new and unprecedented in terms of the COVID response that really will serve your programs um, well going forward? Okay. Thank you, because we'll, let's stop with those two questions. They're two excellent questions, and I think we can spend a lot of time on them. Um, maybe I'll just give everyone a chance and they can respond to one or the other question, if that's okay. Um, maybe, Patwal, I'll start with you. <laughs> yeah. So you get the first choice of the question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I think it's a really great questions regarding to innovation and also gender issue. I will pick for the innovation. Um, when we talk about the innovation, sometimes we think a little bit out of the box. Sometimes we have We've asked several uh, innovation that can help. Uh, I think not exactly innovation, but uh, routine immunization have been uh, affected several times due to the quality of uh, data, uh, either for availability of data timely uh, in the health information system. And we learn from COVID that um, the same uh, database have been used for uh, data entry in daily base and the data was available in terms of utilization of this data have been so critical for decision maker in terms of how, where to allocate uh, the service delivery based on the uh, program performance. So I think it's really important to look because it's the same uh, database, the DHS tool that have been used for COVID and because of political we, um, um, commitment, that database have been, um, I mean, monitored to communicate for whole level uh, in terms of program performance. And this can be sustained in terms of um, for routine immunization to have availability of data uh, in regular base, and it will re reduce the number of registers or the immunization register that they uh, are used at the facility level. It will improve the quality of uh, data and also in terms of time timely availability of this data. So it's really important because is the data that we need, is the data to take decisions, the data for planning, and without this, we cannot really improve. So in our context, we see that this is something that we learn, that we can really keep um, uh, supporting uh, this uh, DHS2 for routine immunization for uh, data entry at um, point of care to ensure availability and the quality of data. I know that is not uh, a apply for all of uh, country because some they already have, but this is the really great tool that uh, can be uh, um, um, strengthening health information data. Thank you. Thank you, Batwal. Dr. Chirima. Yeah, I'm happy to be the second person, so I'll go for the second question. Okay, <laughs> okay great, excellent. <laughs> yeah, so um, in terms of innovation, what we have learned in Nigeria as a key uh, aspect of what we can 
put in or factored into routine immunization or PSC services is the use of GIS enabled micro planning. Um, in Nigeria, yes, we have the normal map uh, on cardboard paper where assumptions were made, you know, but we went beyond that. COVID 19 resources were available for us to go beyond uh, the cardboard paper mapping uh, to identifying settlement, uh, taking geocoordinates from this settlement, assessing the distance between the serving health facility and the settlement, and identifying some natural barriers or even um, uh, some ge geographic uh, uh, obstacles between the settlement, each of the settlement as, uh, uh, as linked to the healthcare uh, facility. And we also, we use that same uh, resources to count, not 100%, but to count and estimate the number of um, uh, total or target population in those settlements. Collectively, uh, we use uh, that to enrich our micro plan and identify other resources and partners that we take on each of these uh, uh, areas identified. And outreaches and also mobile uh, services we are planned and monitored and executed. And uh, in Nigeria also we have a, what they call routine immunization supportive supervision tool. It has two components, one in the health facility and the other one is done through like a sampling or LQS, um, lot quality uh, assessment, uh, community survey, where children within the age of zero to 11 months are sampled and then their immunization st uh, status assessed and recorded. And such is, uh, is linked again to the first question about literacy. Uh, literacy to technologies, literacy to mobile devices, Kobo Collect is very easy uh, once the appropriate trainings and the right tools are deployed. And so with all this, we were able to identify those target population. And we are using the same um, support now to identify zero dose children and under immunized children for effect and we, we reconcile them with the health facility for immunization. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to remind the first question around gender dynamics for <laughs> COVID, if someone would address that. <laughs> I wanted to add to the innovations that Dr. Yakubu mentioned. You know, um, in IMO, it may not be an innovation to you, but it's a very uh, good innovation to us. Using the platform of the traditional leaders as uh, vaccination points. And you see them, they are very excited. Before now, we didn't know we can even approach them. But after COVID vaccine, we now know that we can even touch, touch them. So the, the, in, in, in the last uh, um, outbreak response against polio, we even made them give the oral polio to children. So they are now part of our uh, 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 immunization program. So it's a very good innovation and we are going to continue to use it. Another thing that we, we learned from COVID is the use of uh, vaccination teams from the areas of hard to reach and uh, security compromise. We, before now, we were always concerned how to, you know, uh, uh, hire boats to cross over to the river line areas to vaccinate our children over there. But with COVID vaccine, we are now able to use, train people from those areas to do the job for us. So these are two innovations that have come to stay, and we're going to leverage on them and our subsequent uh, immunization programs. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, regarding gender dynamics, <laughs> uh, you know, talk, uh, taking the example of my state, I, I don't think we had any issue um, 
regarding addressing this probably we uh, analyze the data we have a digital platform which gives the data on male and female vaccination status so at all points of time we had 51 and 49 51 percent males and I mean, the odds are almost equal uh, but other way the innovatively what we did was we uh, had the pink vaccination booths uh, specifically arranged for the females to get access I mean when there is a lot of rush in any camp so the separate camps were made for females so that they could uh, without waste of time they could easily access that and uh, as I already mentioned, in some of the districts where tribal population were there and uh, females were not in a position to take a decision. And another example I think I would want to quote here, uh, in one of the districts where I went to a general hospital to visit there, there were some uh, community ladies. I asked them, have you been vaccinated? They said, no. I asked, why? They said, my husband is in Dubai, so we want his consent. So I said, you could always speak to him over phone. Uh, so <laughs> they were a bit <laughs> reluctant. And OK, OK, I'll go home and then speak and all. So such were uh, very minor issues. That required a little bit of more uh, uh, strategic approach. Uh, so talking to the head of the community, if male is the head of the community, uh, talk to them, convince them, and get it done. Otherwise, it was not a major issue. Uh, and secondly, regarding the innovations uh, in our country, uh, we adopted this uh, digital platform that is Coven, which was the single source of truth for all information pertaining to COVID-19 vaccination, be it uh, coverage, vaccine distribution, then uh, uh, adherence to the web schedule and all those things. So now that has been translated into UVIN, UVIN platform which we have now taken it up under routine immunization. Thank you. Maybe Dr. Sony, I'll uh, ask, you know, since we had talked a lot about behavioral interventions and making sure to address concerns of different groups, to Catherine's question, maybe were there differences in concerns between what men were worried about with side effects or, and versus women, and whether there are differences uh, in terms of both COVID and, and also routine immunization? Yeah, thank you, Grace. I think Dr. Rajin already mentioned, as per the data, uh, we are having almost equal vaccine coverage against the males and the females. But in the field, there are certain situations where there are discrepancies. Females do not have the autonomy to take decisions. So they have to take uh, consent from the male members in the community. So there are certain barriers where we have to convince their male partners to get the female vaccinations also. Secondly, we have try to identify the local influencer in the community who are the female leaders. Sec uh, we have the pregnant women and the mothers who act as ambassadors. We have the government panchayati raj representatives who are the female leaders in the community, whom they own. So we have identified such local leaders and local influencers who are the females who guide us and who have supported the community for vaccination program. And similarly in the schools also, we have identified such uh, uh, ambassadors in the schools who are females uh, schools where they have act as an ambassador to pass on the correct message and get the vaccination. So gender balance definitely we have reviewed it over the period of time and the COVID data platform was every time giving us the real information regarding the gender balance for the vaccination coverage which is going on tracking. So we are tracking that and we have taken intervention based on that particular area. On the second question definitely for innovations multiple innovations have done in the COVID. COVID was a boost and a boon for everyone. So we have learned so many things from the COVID. So the topmost what I remember for the country that a localization the concept of the USAID was one of the thing. That means engaging the local NGOs in the field who have existing footprint to roll out the activities immediately. So the, by the speed and the scale we have done this activity, it was enormous. And in a very short duration, we have started the activity within three months of the camp where the project started. The, NGOs have started their activity in the field. So the engagement of the local NGOs, the localization concept, I think we are able to demonstrate equally how these local NGOs can help to reach the community. And because they have the connect with the community, existing connect with the community, and that has helped us to reach the vaccination. So localization was one of the concepts I think that is important for us. And the faith-based organization, other leaders, what we have identified, definitely the learnings can be utilized 
uh, for an other health system standing activities, especially the urban immunization or routine immunization in those particular area, to reduce the zero dose burden. So other donors are also taking this concept for the localization. So they are also identifying the local NGOs in the community to support other health programs. So in the country, this has already been taken up for the other health programs. So definitely the one of the innovations, what we can say, that was engagement of the local NGOs was good for this project activities, what we have done. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Isaac, you have the last word. Yeah, I, I think gender issue is uh, very difficult to, <laughs> it's, not some of the, it's not one of the things that we, we could confidently say that we, we really looked at, at the influence of gender. But and this reminds me one thing, when we looked at the elderly population in Kenya, the population that you're looking at, there were actually more women vaccinated more than men, unlike in the other populations. And the only thing we could think about was probably there are more women. <laughs> the women population in that cohort is bigger than the male, than the male population. But among the health workers, and where most of them are female, we also saw that sometimes male are higher. And we couldn't explain this. When we talk about digital literacy, I think there are two things that we need to think about. Not only the ability to be able to use the digital tools, but also ability to consume, interpret, evaluate, and interpret the information that you receive, especially through social media. It is, I think I read about one article where it seems like social we, females in our setups tended to believe social media much more than the males. Males tended to take time to, tended to be a bit more critical. But this is something that is not documented. I think it's something that probably is a good challenge that we need, we, we think we can look through. And this is an area that I think we need partners who are, able, who are very strong in Nigeria to be able to help us think through. But I think one of the things, I think in, just to finish up, for my country, I think we looked at the, one of the things that we can carry over from COVID-19 is a digital, digital vaccine the vaccination registry. But I think one of the things that comes up for me is partnership. How do we define partnerships and what are we looking in partnership? We should just look beyond funding and service delivery. Look at what other assets partners can bring when you're doing vaccination. Thank you. Thank you, Isaac. So I know we're out of time. I had other questions, but I won't be able to go into them. But I did want to say a few words because actually those last two questions really provided a great way for us to bring together some of our key points around, um, starting with Betuel, around the importance of data, the importance of engaging NGOs in a, in a discussion, not just providing them information, um, but also hearing their questions and concerns. Uh, the way that we, and not only setting up the systems, but really being sure that people can interpret data um, and are using that. And then some of the last points um, uh, from Dr. Sony and, and Dr. Maguire around engaging local NGOs, using, considering all different types of partners uh, in order to try to um, implement change and address all of the obstacles that we have. Uh, so with that, as we come up to time, I'd like to invite uh, Nida Parks from USAID's COVID response team for some closing remarks. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, thank you to the MRIGHT project team and to the Wilson Center for organizing this today and for everybody for coming. Um, I think this has been a really, really interesting panel and discussion so far. And I'm really honored to be in a room with the people who actually did the work as opposed to the people who sat in Washington and um, talked about how we suggested others do the work. So it's really, really appreciate not just your coming today, but from the very start being kind of the leaders in how we took on this pandemic. Um, you know, it was a matter of getting the actual vaccines out there, that, but then this delivery piece, once we finally were able to get the vaccines everyone needed flowing, um, it was this delivery piece that was absolutely critical and we couldn't have done without your hard work. Um, and just as a reminder in the beginning, remember it was 70%, we were going for 70%, right? And that was just such a high challenge. Um, I think we've right-sized it since then, but um, you know, just to remind us, uh, get a little bit of PTSD of uh, what we were all challenged to do in the beginning, and I know that you were all uh, probably stressed, quite stressed with that challenge. Um, so I think 
again, talking, getting a chance to talk to the folks who were on the ground doing the work today is just is just such a, um, a critical piece of um, our reflection as we look back at lessons learned. Um, I think Dr. Zoma, the example you gave of going from six percent uh, coverage to seventy percent in five months is just testament to. Um, you know, how smart um, and well done all of the interventions were with your leadership um, and the, the partners who were behind you. Um, so I think, you know, we heard a lot about um, getting accurate and timely information. We heard about listening to communities and building trust. Um, you know, Dr. Sony um, combating the misinformation on social media and with local leaders, you know, that was uh, true for you all as a challenge. It was true across the board. I think no country, including the United States, was immune from that challenge. And I think um, the way that people were able to address it was just really remarkable. Um, bringing the idea of bringing new partners to the table and this idea of innovations is um, is just so great to hear about. Um, Dr. Magoya in Kenya, you know, the trust with our um, with the elderly, um, and and that was that's not a group we we try to vaccinate normally. So again, just this was uncharted territory of adult vaccination. Um, so it was really genius the way um, everybody figured out, well, how do we access a group of people who are not part of our routine immunization? Um, so again, this was new and you all thought of these ideas and then implemented them um, successfully. Or with, in Mozambique, accessing workers, um, or as, um, as, as was mentioned, grassroots orgs and kind of influencers um, at the local level. Um, and so, and then I think that hearing from, for example, um, Dr. Tawodros on pivoting, so learning, looking at our data and then learning where things weren't working and pivoting is absolutely critical. And I know that everybody, you know, that was a great example about um, the measles campaign and just simple positioning of the vaccination booth differently. But I think I know that everybody was doing that constantly because we didn't know the right answer, right? So it was a constant challenge of trying one thing. Sometimes it was a flop and you quickly reverse, or sometimes it was really good and, um, and you were able to harness that. Um, so, and I just, I just, you know, for example, one innovation, the idea of these traditional leaders now um, administering um, 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 vaccinations themselves is just remarkable as something that sounds like it will, it will help programs going forward. So I think as we kind of look ahead, we have two key opportunities that are also huge challenges. Um, and that's is, is can, can we take this work and these innovations from COVID-19 um, and ensure that it supports both our, our primary healthcare systems now, so in kind of peacetime, so to speak, while we're not faced with a pandemic, but can we also take this work and these innovations and ensure that it prepares us to be ready for, unfortunately, what, what will likely be some next thing. We hope that it's not um, ever the extent to which COVID was, but um, I think we live in a world now where we know that outbreaks of large scale are possible and probably coming in different forms. Um, and so, you know, all of the work that you all have done, I think has set us up better, us as a world up better for understanding what works, what doesn't work, what do we need to invest in now such that we're better prepared. And just to quote Dr. Yukubi, um, to close is, you know, I think all of this um, work and knowledge and sharing, and um, again, thanks for MRIT and others for bringing us together now, but along the way in these IP forums, because I think that was the intent is to not just have partners and countries working alone, but steal from each other. If somebody has something good, take it and incorporate it. Um, but I think Dr. Yukubi, so, so your, your mention that, um, that all of this works so that we may not, so that we may stand next time, as opposed to being in the kneeling position, um, I, I think is really important. And so um, I know everyone needs a break. We're coming out of the pandemic mode. We need a break. Um, but now it's time to get back to work because I think to, to really sustain these gains, so to speak, takes a tremendous amount of work going forward. So thank you for that. Thank you for all you've done. And thank you for all you will do. <laughs> Thanks.
Thank you, Naida, for those excellent comments. Um, again, I want to thank everyone who joined us both in the room and online today. I want to let's give a big hand for our panelists and all of our lightning speakers. Um, and thank you very much. Bye.